For those who oppose nuclear power, the number one issue is usually nuclear waste. It's understandable to fear waste that can kill you if you stand too close to it and remains radioactive for tens of thousands of years. On the contrary, nuclear advocates treat nuclear waste as a non-issue. Sure, it needs to be disposed of properly, but it's much less problematic than the waste from coal. But that doesn't mean it isn't an issue, and if we don't handle nuclear waste properly, it has the possibility of being much worse than pollution from other forms of energy. This is especially true when compared to wind and solar, which have no significant waste issues. So as part of my series on nuclear power, let's look at the nuclear waste carefully before we bury it for 10,000 years. Nuclear fuel is made up of about 4% uranium-235, which is actively part of the reactions that generate heat, and 96% uranium-238, which is not fissile, which means that when a thermal neutron hits it, it doesn't split and release energy. I talk more about this and basic nuclear physics in my video on the natrium fast neutron reactor. The fuel is not dangerously radioactive and doesn't need extreme safety measures to handle. After several years in the reactor, the fuel is no longer active and it's removed. The U.S. produces about 2,000 tons of spent fuel per year. The spent fuel is primarily three components most of the uranium-238 and a small amount of the uranium-235 is still there. Fission products from splitting the uranium-235 and transuranic or actinide elements created by uranium-238 absorbing a neutron. There are also some trace amounts of other elements that we're going to ignore. First, let's focus on the fission products. When uranium-235 is struck by a neutron, it splits into multiple smaller atoms, releasing energy. This is the core reaction of these power plants. Two common daughter nuclei are barium-144 and krypton-89. Both of these are unstable and decay into other elements until they reach one that is stable. All of this decaying makes the spent fuel very dangerous until the fission products reach a stable element. The fission products make up about 3% of the spent fuel. Next is the transuranic or actinide elements. Uranium can capture a neutron and transmute into heavier elements like neptunium and plutonium. These are referred to as transuranic or actinide. These are long-lived radioactive elements that create the long-term headache that nuclear waste is known for. They make up about 1% of the spent fuel. This plot is a bit complicated, but it's worth looking at carefully. It's a log-log plot, which means that every major tick is a factor of 10. The x-axis goes from 10 years to 100 years, all the way to a million years. The dashed horizontal line down the middle is the radioactivity of natural uranium. 10 years after the spent fuel is removed from the reactor, it's about a thousand times more radioactive than it was when it was introduced. The dark line represents the decay of the fission products, and after 270 years, those elements have decayed enough to no longer be a significant concern. But the actinides, or transuranic elements, continue to be radioactive for much longer. It takes about 130,000 years until the waste is as safe as the fuel that entered the reactor. So how do we safely deal with the waste? Luckily for everyone, there's an easy solution to deal with fresh nuclear waste. A giant swimming pool, which stops the radiation and carries away the heat. The amount of heat released by the radioactive decay isn't that much, so the pool would make for a very disappointing hot tub. As long as the water remains in the pool and the fuel rods remain intact, there's no danger to anyone working in the building. If repairs are needed, scuba divers can go into the pool, but care needs to be taken that they don't get too close to the fuel rods.
the waste stays there until enough of the fission products have decayed to stable elements that carrying away the heat is no longer a concern, between five and 10 years. It's still dangerously radioactive, so care must be taken. The pool isn't big enough to store all of the fuel rods that will be used over the lifetime of the power plant, so eventually they need to go somewhere. The next stage is typically dry cask storage. The waste is taken out of the pool and put into giant containers. Most of these casks are stored on site, though there are some approved off-site storage facilities. The casks are designed to withstand any possible event, from an earthquake to a plane loaded with explosives flying straight into them. They are lined with radiation blocking materials, so you can safely walk right up to them. Nothing is needed to keep the waste stored in this manner safe other than basic security and monitoring. The intention is for the wastes to be stored in these casks until the contents can be transferred to a permanent home. But the U.S. reactor fleet is getting pretty old, and finding a home for this waste when the power plant is decommissioned will be problematic. There are 71 reactors in the U.S. that are 50 years old or older, so there's a fair amount of waste looking for a forever home. The casks are licensed for up to 40 years, and some are already 30 years old. They are monitored and inspected, and they've been effective up to this point. It's likely they can be safely relicensed for another 40 years but the waste remains dangerously radioactive for 130,000 years, and the casks definitely won't last that long. The ideal place to store the waste is deep underground, where no one will interact with it effectively forever. Finland will soon have the world's first forever home for commercial spent fuel when they open a geological tomb for their nuclear waste that will be able to safely and permanently store about a century's worth of Finland's nuclear waste deep underground. The U.S. does have a permanent storage site for high-level military nuclear waste, which has been plagued with safety concerns and minor accidents. The U.S. started building a geological repository for commercial nuclear waste in Yucca Mountain, Nevada. But the work on that facility stopped and is unlikely to ever be restarted. There's not even a site that is going through the permitting process. So, for the immediate term, in the U.S., the waste will continue to be stored in dry casks. But France, which is the country most reliant on nuclear power, doesn't have geological storage. And it's less a problem for them than for the U.S. Why is that? It's because they reprocess or recycle their spent fuel. Reprocessing separates out the highly radioactive fission products from the uranium-238 and the transuranic elements like plutonium. The fission products need to be carefully stored, but they make up less than 5% of the spent fuel and decay after centuries rather than over 100,000 years. So the storage problem is much simpler. Uranium-238 is not radioactive and can't be made into a bomb. So dealing with it is not a concern. Some will be mixed in with the recovered plutonium to make mixed oxide fuel or MOX fuel to go back into the reactors. So why doesn't the largest nuclear power on earth, the USA, reprocess their spent fuel? There are two reasons. First, the only president who was a nuclear engineer, Jimmy Carter, thought it was a bad idea. Of the materials that can be made into an atomic bomb, one of them, plutonium-239, is extracted and reprocessing. For technical reasons, it's easier to make a bomb out of plutonium than uranium once you have it. Carter's fear was that reprocessing would put plutonium at multiple civilian sites with less security than military sites handling material that could be used to make a bomb. A terrorist organization might stage a military raid on a nuclear power plant and steal their fuel to turn it into a bomb. The other reason not to bother with reprocessing is that there's plenty of uranium in the world, and it's cheaper to enrich raw ore that's not radioactive than process spent fuel, which is highly radioactive. 
To my thinking, if you include the cost of really effectively storing nuclear waste for 100,000 years, then the economics of reprocessing might make sense. And though there's a real proliferation risk, France and others have been managing it effectively. And it's not too late for the U.S. We could build a reprocessing plant and start with the oldest fuel, where the fission products have decayed the most, making them easier to handle. An option that's similar to reprocessing is burning the fuel in a fast neutron reactor, like the natrium plant that TerraPower is building in Wyoming. The fast neutrons can trigger reactions in the plutonium, greatly increasing the energy that can be extracted and shortening the period that the spent fuel is dangerous. There are many concepts being actively pursued that use fast neutrons to burn transuranic elements, but very few in operation or construction. One thing that separates nuclear power from fossil fuels is the pollution is very dense. It's incredibly dangerous per volume compared to what comes out of a coal or natural gas plant. But the more important difference is the comes out. Years of emission controls have made fossil fuel plants cleaner than they once were, but they still emit a lot of pollution into the biosphere, while nuclear power's waste is being carefully stored. Pollution in a concrete cask harms no one. Looking at this chart, natural gas kills about 100 times as many people per kilowatt hour as nuclear and coal another 10 times on top of that. And this doesn't include climate change. So nuclear waste is not a reason not to start building new nuclear power plants. For now, we can continue to store the spent fuel from our existing plants in casks, but we need to find a more permanent solution before the nuclear renaissance can take off at scale. We can follow the Finns and build a deep repository, or we can follow the French and reprocess our spent fuel into something that's much easier to manage. Maybe we should do both. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you want to support my work, you can buy me a Guinness. Please like if you've learned something. Over 500 of you have already subscribed, and thanks to every one of you. It really does help build this channel. You can click here to see some of my other videos on nuclear power. And please share this video with anyone you know who has strong thoughts, pro or con, on nuclear power.